This is Digital Music Trends 141 on the 17th of July 2013. This week the big streaming debate as Atoms for Peace pull out of Spotify, growth in Norway and Sweden, AT&T buying Leap Wireless, Jay-Z's first week results and Apple's Logic X. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, uh, the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and more and you can email feedback to contact at digitalmusictrends.com and digitalmusictrends.com is currently being optimized for search by Venture Harbor so I'd like to extend them my thanks uh, for putting the work in and helping out uh, on the site so if you're looking for content, search or social marketing design and more, check them out at adventureharbor.com and this week we have a big show ahead and so I'm going to move straight into the introductions uh, so today a very big panel um, we start with Martin Davis uh, a developer evangelist at Sangrid and uh, music hack day co- co-founder slash co-conspirator right how's it going yeah. very good thank you I apologize for the uh, ever increasing level of shininess that you're going <laughs> to get out of me today yeah, it's uh, it's pretty hot in this room as well. I had to shut the window uh, to to avoid external noise, and so you know if you, if you start seeing sweat patches, I apologize for that. And uh, uh, also, uh, great to have on the show Andrea Gutzke and Eric Eitel on, on the same webcam, and they both do lots of work in the tech and music space, and, and are organizing the conference portion of Berlin Music Week. So it's great to have you guys on the show. How's it going? Hey, Hi, it's fine. Pretty hot here as well. <laughs> Excellent, great to have you. And uh, then we have uh, uh, Darren Hemmings, uh, a DMT regular, founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown, as well as a daily bearer of news with his daily digest, which is highly recommended. So, hi, Darren, great to have you back. Hello, good to be here. Awesome. And last but not least, Duncan Gier, a freelance writer for a number of publications, including Wired and Tech Raider. So, hi, Duncan, and thanks for joining us uh, from uh, Gothenburg. Oh, hi there, how's it going? Awesome, thank you. And so, uh, why so many guests this week? Well, in case you are living in a bubble or if you uh, hold Digital Music Trends as your only source of news, in which case uh, I applaud you and I'm flattered, uh, you won't have missed the story around the artists' compensation and uh, streaming services that exploded in the last few days around a series of tweets from producer Nigel Godrich on Sunday. And I hope we can condense on the show some of the excellent points of view that were expressed in a number of articles in the past few days uh, on the issue. So, uh, you know, we're going to try and talk about uh, the overall debate about compensation, whether artists should get more money uh, and uh, whether they should expect to get more money. We're going to talk about a few of the other points that were made around that issue and also talk about what Spotify could do to improve what they do for artists and uh, whether there's any other ways that the service can help them make more money other than pay them, paying them more for the streams. And so, uh, you know, I thought I'd, I'd start out by just reading out uh, the tweets that started this whole issue. I think it's uh, worth doing just because it generated the whole debate and at least we know what we're talking about. Uh, and so, first of all, uh, this, these are the Nigel Goderick tweets uh, from, I think it was a Sunday, I, I think. Uh, and so he said, um, anyway, here's one. We're off of Spotify. Can't do that no more, man. A small, meaningless rebellion. Someone gotta say something. It's bad for new music. Uh, this is just uh, Eraser and Amok and Ultralista. The reason is that new artists get paid uh, fuck all with this model. It's an equation that just doesn't work. The music industry has been taken over by the back door, and if we don't try to make it fair for new music producers and artists, then art will suffer. Make no mistake, uh, these are all the same old industry bots trying to get a hold on the delivery system. Uh, the numbers don't even add up for Spotify yet. Uh, it's not about that. It's about establishing the model, which will be extremely uh, valuable. Uh, meanwhile, small labels and new artists can't even keep their lights on. It's just not right. Plus, people are scared to speak up or not take part, as they're being told that they will lose invaluable exposure if they don't play ball. Meanwhile, min- millions of streams get uh, uh, gets them a few thousand dollars, not like radio at all. Anyway, then the breaks. Opinions welcome, but discussion and new thinking necessary. And then he goes on to say that, you know... Uh, Making music costs money if you're not making it just on a laptop, if you need musicians in a studio, and saying that the Pink Floyd catalog uh, uh, you know, makes sense now on streaming because, of course, they've already made their money off the music and everything else is a plus. But if uh, you were to make uh, uh, you know, a Pink Floyd record today, uh, you wouldn't have the budget to do it because you wouldn't be able to get the money back through streaming services. So this is sort of the, the gist of the tweets that he posted, and it's, it's quite a long uh, uh, line of thoughts. Uh, and uh, Tom York from Radiohead also echoed these tweets by retweeting quite a few and posting his own thoughts, which kind of echoed uh, Nigel's anyway. And so, first of all, I want to 
go around everybody and just uh, talk about what was your first reaction when you heard ab about this. Uh, did you expect somebody to at some point come out uh, uh, on this uh, particular debate uh, with uh, such force uh, and somebody so influential? And uh, uh, at the same time, why do you think uh, somebody like uh, Nigel Godrick and Tom York make sense to uh, have uh, you know kick-started once again a debate that has really been ongoing in the industry press for for a long time so uh, first of all uh, uh, Duncan any thoughts on the matter well I mean uh, to answer the question of what my first thought was I was really disappointed because I'm actually quite a big Nigel Godrich fan I love a lot of the production work he's done not yeah. just on Radiohead but also on people like Beck and Travis and the Divine Comedy all kinds of people he's done some amazing amazing musical work and that's why yeah. I was so disappointed that somebody who I respected so much on a musical point of view could be so as I see it kind of short-sighted in, in not really seeing the benefits of, of a streaming service. Yeah, and uh, uh, Darren, on, on your side, what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is, uh, you know, the, your main reaction from that when you when you saw that? Uh, a degree of eye rolling on a similar level, I think, to Duncan, in the sense that my my unease around this often stems from the fact that um, it <laughs> it won't endear me to the artist community, but I often feel that uh, artists tend not to be the best people to speak out on this stuff because. Yeah. You know, there's a reason that you have labels and managers and marketing people and things like that and it's usually so that theoretically at least the artist can be left to get on with their art and being creative now that's not to dumb them down or insult them by saying that they, they you know they're too stupid to be a part of the discussion but certainly um, I you know based on what I know and based on what I see people then saying online where you've had artists speak out, um, often, particularly when they start quoting numbers and things like that, they're frequently a little bit wide of the mark and things like that. So uh, my initial response was certainly a bit of a, oh, God, here we go again sort yeah. of yeah. thing. Um, of beyond that, I think it's it's probably opened up like a, um, a good discussion there relative to what more Spotify could do. I don't think that's a bad discussion to have, but I think you can have that discussion without demonizing Spotify in the process and yeah, of course and equally as an aside I, I do slightly tire of everyone pointing the finger at Spotify <laughs> and we've got that I think, like a massive critic it's, exa it's uh, essentially like a, a scapegoat for every single you know it's, it's a good name to uh, face to, to put to a name of streaming services because the public would probably take less interest in it if it just says streaming services are bad but if it says spotify are bad they have somebody to pin it onto and uh, and martin uh, what was your reaction when you saw these tweets first of all i think for me uh probably again a similar level of eye rolling and also a kind of sense of oh not again um you know this kind of it crops up you know almost every month at the minute someone has yeah. to speak out and say oh yeah by the way streaming services they're not paying us enough just in case you'd forgotten about last month where they weren't paying us enough still so yeah um and i don't know some of the some of the tweets just felt uh kind of stream of consciousness which is fair enough and a, a little bit misinformed i mean the comparison of you know it's not like radio is possibly one of the stupidest things he possibly could have said um everybody gets it's not like radio the reason that the royalty payments aren't the same is simply because you're not forced to listen to the music on a streaming yeah. service it's your choice if you're listening to the radio you are forced to listen to what they play you so say for instance like radio one share of that market is eight to ten million people they have to pay a higher royalty payment because that's the amount of people that are going to be listening to a track at a particular time you cannot do a comparison of streaming service and radio and complain that one pays more and the other doesn't yeah. it's ridiculous yeah, yeah. and uh, eric and andrea uh, respectively like uh, what are your thoughts on on the reactions front yeah, I just saw this article on, on Fact Magazine today that um, um, Tom York's, one of the Radiohead's co-managers, uh, Brian Message, actually uh, yeah, made his own point uh, on public intervention and said, like, it's actually an ongoing debate. So, as you, as you guys said already, I mean, this is, this is a discussion that is going on for, for quite a while and yeah. it's, it's just... Um, some some more input and, and maybe a sign set, but um, yeah, I, I also see it as an ongoing debate, and and I think this 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 um, comment by Brian was actually pretty cool to make at this point to just yeah. uh, calm it down a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it's I think it's important to just have like a very uh, relaxed debate about this because 
we, we've we've all said that this is something that's been going on for for quite some time, and of course this is not the first artist that points the problem out. I think uh, what makes the story interesting this week is the fact that uh, I think it comes at a, a at a time where uh, perhaps there are different factors coming in converging to make people think about these issues a little bit more uh, than maybe they have in the past few months or where especially in the US uh, the debate has all been centered around Pandora and internet radio rates uh, and so uh, I guess this brings a little bit of focus back onto Spotify and what they are doing and what they're not doing and so uh, one of the fir- you know the first things that I wanted to, to talk about was that a few of the articles that came out uh, were uh, talking about uh, what artists should expect from uh, streaming services and whether they should expect to be making more money off them. So whether the services are not paying them enough, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, we know that Spotify is paying around 70% of their uh, of their income in, into royalties. So that's already quite a high percentage. And it's similar in a way to what uh, iTunes, uh, iTunes pays back on, on download sales. So, uh, you know, an interesting point from Zach Greenberg from Forbes was, for example, that if you're a musician and you're just starting out, you don't get really almost any spins on the radio, you don't get millions of downloads on the iTunes store, you probably don't have a record deal, and so should you be expecting to make uh, a significant amount of money from uh, a smaller number of plays? And uh, uh, Martin pointed me to a Guardian piece uh, that was published uh, yesterday on uh, the artist Sam Duckworth that points out uh, he's uh, uh, an independent artist, he he points to his uh, 4,685 Spotify plays from his last solo album that equated to £19. And so... This is an example of an artist that uh, is, uh, uh, you know, starting out, uh, is not making a lot of money uh, from Spotify, but is not making a lot of money in general, probably anyway. So should artists be expecting to make more money from the service? Uh, and uh, uh, if so, is that even feasible? Because Spotify is already paying so much in, in royalties. Martin, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's always, you know, it's it's fair to expect that, you know, at a certain point you should probably be getting more. Particularly, you know, when you look at the amount of investment that companies like Spotify take on, you think, okay, well, they have, you know, $300 million. Why can't I have a little bit more for my money? Um, I think there's a real lack of understanding um, against more traditional models like putting out physical records or getting your stuff played on the radio versus streaming that people don't necessarily understand how those companies, which are innately a software company, actually work and can operate and how much that actually costs, particularly when it comes to the infrastructure required to manage uh, the kind of loads that these services are under. And I think that there is a kind of expectation that because uh, it's just a way of delivering music, that it's the same as everything that has gone before and therefore should be paying its fair share. But that is not the case in any way. This is a new model still. This is a different way of doing things. And, um, you know, they're paying in my mind, as much as they probably can pay at this moment in time. And that may well increase down the line yeah. if there's a significant change, maybe after an IPO, um, you know, which would be interesting in itself. But uh, at the moment, I think, you know, what's being paid, you know, per stream equates to, you know, something fair enough. If you're going to get 5,000 streams and that's going to pay you 19 pounds, you know, equivalents elsewhere would be relatively similar. Yeah, and Darren, yeah. do you get that? You know, speaking to yeah. artists directly, do do you feel like there is a a sense that they would like to see more money coming from the service, or is there a general generally an understanding that this is the deal and and that's that's how it goes? I mean, you know, I work on a lot of artist campaigns, and while I haven't debated this with them directly, I mean, you know, anecdotally, certain certainly artists I've talked to um, have you know expressed that kind of maxim of, oh, they don't pay enough and things like that, as if it's just a, a sort of truism, really. Yeah. I, the, I mean, you know, artists, everyone's always going to want more money, right? So, you know, everybody's going to sit there and given the option, if someone said, would you like us to pay you more, then only a fool would say no. But yeah. <laughs> um, equally, you know, it, I've seen observations across the board where people are kind of saying, well, you know, records aren't really where you make a huge amount of money anyway. And there's a, like, I have a slight issue with, with artists. You know, I read the Sam Dutworth piece about people consuming that, you know, his streams and the money he got from it. But there's a sort of weird thing there where it's being talked about as if this is his sole stream of income, you know, yeah. and it's, yeah. I find that a bit odd. And it's just, you know, you, you have to find new ways of doing things. 
And that's not to excuse this. I mean, I, I don't want to start on a, on a default position of kind of Spotify pays a perfectly good amount and everyone should stop moaning. That's not it yeah. at all. But it bothers me slightly when these things are pulled a little bit out of context from the bigger picture of, you know, all of the broader income streams. I mean, that's why I was quite pleased when I saw that Eamon Ford posted quite a nice little summary on The Guardian of all the other places that artists can make money. Yeah. Because it's an important consideration in the conversation. You know, and those sorts of things I think are pretty important. And, you know, and it does lead on to this whole issue of, you know, could Spotify do more to kind of upsell on behalf of artists? And I think probably the answer to that is yes. And I suspect that's where Jimmy Iovine's service, you know, with Beats and that may seek to sort of potentially gain some ground. But, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, an artist that's saying, well, we'd like to earn more money from that is a bit kind of like, well, duh, you know, <laughs> really. Um, that's the nature of the game. But, and I think also there's a sort of strange kind of righteousness and indignation around this whole topic when I think there's, there's probably, there's, you know, there's a, a, an ogre that you could always hold up over the years, whether it was MTV building empires, you know, billion dollar empire without sufficiently paying people or the US radio system, which until only a few years ago was paying absolutely nothing for play. You know, there's always been these things where people can stand up and complain about them, but the industry has sort of endured and adapted and survived, you know, throughout that. So I don't, I don't feel like this is perhaps as catastrophic as it's being made out to be. Yeah. And, and, and talking about Germany, you know, you, you guys have um, had uh, uh, alternative streaming services relatively recently, really, compared to Simify, for example, that was around uh, for a long time before that. And so uh, has this debate been going on in Germany as well? And uh, was... Uh, did it start with Simfy when the when Simfy started uh, uh, operating in Germany? Um, yeah, the same, yeah, I think is the same in Germany as well. Although, well, I think it it's more it has become bigger more recently with also the bigger players like Spotify. Simfy never reached like that kind of popularity, I would say. Right. Uh, over, over here, scale. <laughs> <laughs> that much. So, so with Spotify as a big player on the market, it also uh, 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 like it became more important over here. But what I wanted to say also on the on the question before uh, is that um, I think also is a it's a matter of expectation what you can expect from from a streaming service. Yeah. Um, because if you, if you think a, a streaming replaces like a label income for you or something, then uh, like as it was traditionally, then I think that that doesn't work and also works for only certain types of music, like music that you listen to a lot. And in that sense. It's also a bit, it's much more like replacing radio than re replacing a label because there's lots of music that you just don't listen to a lot, even though you would have bought a record a a traditionally. So, so if you expect, so it's a matter of uh, what, what's your expectation, but still I think always those kind of tweets and uh, showing your frustration about something is still valuable because the discussion needs to be kept going like yeah. even if it's annoying and even you know if you if you say yeah those things you know have to be tried on the market and so on but it's, it's always important to have a discussion going and to have different perspectives all the time so. yeah and coming back to your question um, about like the situation over here i think it's uh, just like uh, everywhere else like you have Spotify as the placeholder for music streaming and so they have to fight the war in the way at the moment and the other guys just stuck. <laughs> Yeah, sure. And uh, Duncan, uh, you made an interesting point on Tech Radar. You, uh, Tech Radar published two opinion pieces, one by yourself and one by James Rivington. And one was uh, uh, your title, Tom York is wrong, uh, Spotify is brilliant for new music. Uh, and the other one, Tom York is right, Spotify isn't that great for new music. And yours, it was the Tom York is wrong piece. And uh, you disagree with the point that Spotify is bad for new music, especially when looking at the low barrier of entry uh, you know, versus audience and also the uh, disincentive that it provides on the piracy front, like we've seen in, in in uh, a lot of cases that, you know, the, the argument is that Spotify disincentivizes people from using um, piracy as an option to listen to music. So uh, would you care us talk us through those two points just so that we, we sort of uh, make a more all-rounded debate on that? Yeah, sure, certainly. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll start with the piracy thing because that's easy. When Daniel Eck, the um, founder of Spotify, launched Spotify, he always said that he wanted to create something that was better than piracy. And um, I think that most people, most listeners, most users of the service would say that he's definitely done that. He the 
that most people who use Spotify are now pirating far, far, far less than they used to. Um, and the, those that are still pirating are pirating mostly stuff that isn't available on Spotify yet, things like the Beatles, that kind of thing. So I think you can make a very, very convincing argument that um, Spotify is doing a very good job of helping to kill piracy. Um, the second point about um, other stuff that, that bands can get from Spotify is that you've got to remember that when you're a new band, and we haven't really kind of defined here what a new band is, um, I'm going to sort of like assume we're talking about a band that's just signed to a label or something like that rather than somebody who's trying to sort of sell their own records off their own back and things like that. But if you're talking about a band that's just signed to a label, then um, you have to sort of think about who you're selling your stuff to. And if you don't have any fans, it's quite difficult to find people to sell your stuff to. Sell your gig tickets, sell your merchandise, sell a million other revenue streams too. And Streaming is incredibly effective at building that fan base for you because it's really, really easy to spread your music around. You can share stuff, you can put stuff on playlists. It's incredibly effective at getting your music out there. So if, you, if you're using streaming to get your music out there to loads and loads of people, you've then got a huge audience that you can sell other stuff to. That's the argument that I would put forward to why Spotify is good for new bands. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And uh, talking about... Um... I, I want to mash two of the points that were made, actually. Uh, so there was an interesting... Uh, rebuttal of the CEO of Ticketmaster, uh, Nathan Hubbard, uh, to an article that uh, was published uh, uh, by uh, Bob Lefsetz uh, on the Lefsetz letter, uh, who is uh, controversial as always. Uh, he uh, talks about uh, you know, how uh, you, know, you can't uh, get anybody but diehard fans now to pay for downloads, uh, and uh, only York and Goderick's uh, diehard fans uh, care about their misguided removal uh, of their music from Spotify. Uh, everybody else shrugs and moves right along, and so they're not going to find their music, essentially. And he talks about how, you know, in, in Scandinavia, for example, uh, the li Lions revenue, uh, share of the li revenue is uh, streaming. And uh, uh, there was a nice rebuttal of that from the CEO of uh, Ticketmaster, Nathan Hubbard, who uh, goes to suggest that, uh, in his opinion, uh, artists should you uh, should actually unionize he says there is no artist union there should be managers and agents keep that from happening because they're afraid of poaching if they let another representative get close to their artists but artists aren't demanding unionization uh, either uh, collaboratively collaboratively in the live, live business uh, the unionization could actually provide lots of good stuff like uh, stopping poisonous attacks on artists rights and, and uh, try to get a cheap ticket uh, to the fancy legislation force better consumer experience uh, with all in pricing, drive full inventory disclosure, and all this kind of stuff that could be, you know, good for for the live side if artists were to unionize. These are actually interesting points in themselves because it's funny that the CEO of Ticketmaster is making them while they seem to be actually causing some of those issues. But uh, in in any case, uh, moving along on that, I just wanted to make the point that he's talking about artists providing a, a cohesive front as as a whole to go to services and say, look, this is what we need. And this is what we'd like to have from you to help improve our sales or help improve our monetization. Uh, and kind of like in a similar sense, uh, Stuart Dresch from Musical.ly uncovers a key point in this debate, which is improving uh, Spotify's value to new artists. So uh, he says, my inkling is that the biggest way streaming services can help new artists make a living is to go farther still and become the bridge between people discovering music and spending money with its creators elsewhere. Uh, and so, you know, the Discover tab is uh, one of those things that can help uh, fans uh, know about a gig, for example, via Songkick. Uh, but there's, uh, according to Stuart, and, and of course, uh, I think we will we'll think that there is scope to do more. And uh, like Darren was mentioning at the beginning, uh, the uh, uh, Beats platform Daisy, uh, you know, at least uh, in their, when they are, uh, set out to, to start this uh, new business that is going to launch later in the year, they want to integrate all those features and perhaps even top spin within the streaming service so that fans can get access to much more than just streaming. They can buy merchandise, they can do all sorts of stuff on the service. So, so first of all, do you think this uh, unionization proposal uh, has some legs in terms of pro providing a united front for, for artists and can make sense? And second of all, do you think that uh, Spotify hasn't moved fast enough when it comes to uh, providing added value services to the artist that is sports on the platform and, and whether it will do so in the future. So, uh, Darren, first of all. I mean, I think, well, I mean, as numerous people have sort of pointed out, there are actually unions for musicians and things like that. Of course. So there is a degree of representation. There, but um, I think it's pretty complex, really, because I just find myself wondering how many people are going to start weighing in on this debate. It's... It's very tricky when, you know, artists have managers and 
in conjunction with the managers, they sign to labels and the labels represent their content. It's not, you know, when, whenever there is a negotiation going on, the negotiation is always with the representatives, as in the appointed representatives for that, you know, issue at hand. And so it concerns me slightly that it may make the problem a little more complicated in the sense that you'll then have labels pushing for their part, artists pushing for their part, and it may just sort of create a level of bureaucracy that, that actually hinders rather than helps. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, my, my initial thing was kind of, I think it would certainly be a help if artists were speaking with one voice that actually got its facts right and was, you know, speaking with correct insight, because I think when artists tend to go a little bit kind of rogue in the manner that we've seen numerous ones do to date, where they weigh in on the Spotify and streaming revenues debate, you know, it, it, um, it can be tricky because they often don't have their facts right or, you know, there's, there's issues there. And speaking on behalf of everybody is not necessarily doing the everybody that you're bringing into this any favours. So, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty difficult. I, I don't know, you know, artists are a very disparate, creative bunch. They're not very, you know, there's a reason they've got all these representatives around them, as I said earlier. And I, it just, yeah, I... I, I I question how totally workable it might be, even yeah. if in theory yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah, uh, Martin, on that front, do you think that uh, there is some uh, merit in saying that there's more that can be done on the platform itself to service uh, uh, added value stuff to uh, fans of the band? Now that, especially now that uh, fans are uh, starting to be able to follow specific artists, uh, and and there is a potential there for creating a whole ecosystem within the Spotify browser, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's huge scope for doing something like that. I think that it's probably worth making the point that, you know, I, I suspect, um, you know, from my time in the music industry and from the artists that I've spoken to, that one of the biggest frustrations that they have is about lack of control or relinquishing a level of control over to, you know, a certain number of representation, a certain number of representatives, or over to the label in its entirety, you know, to various different managers and actually, you know, frustrations from within the label itself about who's actually managing certain things around a particular release or around a particular artist. And, you know, I'm not even going to single out Spotify in this. I think that every uh, streaming platform could do more to allow the artists to shift more of their product, whether it be merchandise, whether it be tickets, uh, just whether it be a way of getting more information about that artist out to the user in a space where the user is. Now, this is to say that, you know, there are a lot of people using the platforms and, you know, it is a great portal for interaction and particularly in Spotify's case, it is just a browser based inside a client when you go as far as the desktop client is concerned. Um, so there is huge scope there. And, you know, the, the application uh, platform technologies are there already in there to be doing this. And, you know, artists, you know, could go as far as building their own applications, which then streamed their own stuff and allowed you to buy all of their stuff and did all of that in there. But that's still a very tricky process to actually get that stuff live. And it hasn't been as popular as I think everybody hoped it would be because they've been quite restrictive in terms of the amount of applications that they're letting onto the platform. That said, you know, for every single artist page that you see now inside uh, both the web client and uh, the desktop client, there is uh, more information than there was before, but not a lot of it is useful to artists in terms of actually converting further revenue streams. Yeah. You know, the amount of uh, the amount of listens, you know, the clarity around that that you can now see is fine, but you know, it doesn't help much. It just shows you that people have been listening to it. Well, that's great. Thanks very much. We can see that on the statement that says we own 14p. Um, it's, you know, linking out to other stuff would be, uh, you know, um, um, a small start, but I think that, you know, what what Daisy's planning on doing and integrations with stuff like Topspin is a is another step forward, but I don't think that any of the streaming services have been as aggressive as they could have been in terms of actually yeah. allowing the artists to control more about how they are viewed within their services. Yeah, and Duncan, like just a, a out there idea, just you know, just to stir the debate. You know, what if uh, 
For example, uh, there is already an infrastructure in place for display advertising within Spotify that applies to people that are not paying uh, for for the service uh, for the premium, and so they have advertising. Uh, what if uh, some of that? Of course, you know, not not to the same extent as, as it's, uh, it's pushed on people that are not paying. But what if some of that uh, advertising space uh, was uh, uh, devoted for the people that are paying a premium pricing? Uh, to uh, advertising uh, stuff related to the band that that the person is listening to, like whether it be their the next gig or merchandise, do you think that would be completely Im impossible and unworkable as a, as a as an idea? No, I mean it it would be as as long as it was incredibly well related to the artist, then then yes, that is something that could possibly be done. But I think what we have to remember here, we're kind of talking about all of this like um, like the artists are the customer here, and they're not. The listeners are the customer. Spotify has done an incredible incredibly good job at getting listeners to really, really, really like it. That's what it's been working on. That's how it's built its huge user base. And that's what delivers more and increasing numbers to the artists. Okay, yeah. Getting more listeners onto Spotify makes more money for the artists. So the number one priority for Spotify is always for the, the listener to be happy rather than necessarily the artist. And yeah, sure, there are a lot of things like, you know, selling gig tickets and merchandise and stuff through it. Some of the things that we've discussed that could definitely make the listener happy as well. But in terms of focus, Spotify's number one priority has to be the listener. Absolutely. It can't be anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess, uh, uh, Eric uh, uh, and, and Andrea, like the music industry is weird in the sense that uh, there is a very special relationship between fans and the bands. And so, of course, if the, the service that the fans are using to consume the band's music uh, is perceived as something that is, is somehow damaging the band or, or the bands are expressing doubts about that particular model, then, of course, that's gonna, you know, the fans are going to take notice of that just because they, have, you know, they, they, they love their, the bands that they listen to and they want to make sure that, that their artists are supported. Do you think that's, uh, that's a fair case to make, that the industry... In, in this situation is quite a weird one because you know most uh, supply and demand industries you know you get the good and you walk away happy and if the supplier is not happy then takes it up with uh, the the distributor rather than with the customer but in this case the debate is reaching consumers and that's changing the way that it's perceived right yeah, I, was, I was about to say um, we should definitely make it an uh, optional model for the user um, I, I had to think about this um, for instance like the, the app system, the app store, like um, Songkick, for instance, you just um, check in, um, get this app, and then get your um, concert um, um, dates delivered. Um, why not checking in for, for merchandise or whatever kind of stuff um, bands want to sell to their, um, to their listeners? And, and it's yeah. not too pushy, it's not too, too um, um, advertise-wise, it's more like the option to, to, to get more stuff from the band you like. I mean, that, that could be like an interesting way to, to implement, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I think we have uh, uh, exhausted most of the points that were made in the last few days. I, I hope we've made a, a decent uh, summary of this. But uh, uh, staying on streaming and actually sort of I I related to what we just talked about is the story about uh, uh, what's happening in in the the Nordic countries, uh, so in Norway especially, is in Scandinavia, and uh, the report is that uh, once again uh, Norway has stunned the recording music industry with the local IFPI's division posting a 17% increase in uh, uh, total music sales uh, uh, for the first half of 2013. So uh, streaming grabs two thirds of the pie with 66% of revenues, which is insane, uh, coming from the likes of Spotify and other streaming services, while downloads and physical sales are both down respectively 21% and 29% year on years so is cannibalization happening yes it is uh, do we care no because in this case uh, uh, the industry is still growing so a similar story is happening in Sweden where music revenues were up 13.8% with again streaming having the lion's share so we're back here where we were a few months ago trying to understand whether there is anything we can take away from this incredible success stories and these figures that are coming from Norway and, 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 and Sweden. Uh, you know, uh, Duncan, I guess I, I can call on you because you, you live sort of in, in the Scandinavia type area, but uh, I wanted to ask you sort of, uh, do you think there's, uh, once again, is there anything that is remotely replicable or are these a very narrow set of circumstances that these countries find themselves in, in terms of uh, uh, the connectivity of the population, uh, the income of the population, that make it possible for streaming to be so well adopted? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, basically, Scandinavia, <laughs> I've, I've lived here for uh, about a year now, and what I've discovered is that Scandinavia is basically a few years ahead of Britain in terms of most everything. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of uh, streaming availability, it's, it's exactly the same. The kind of stuff you've talked about, you, you, you've talked about internet connections, you've talked about um, society and small populations. It's quicker for them to move, but they have generally the same kinds of society as, as Britain does. And so for this to be applicable to Britain and, and arguably the rest of Europe as well, then, um, yeah, you just have to look a couple of years down the line. If you, if you compare the, these num like the numbers that Scandinavia had a couple of years ago to the numbers we've got in Britain today, you'll find them really, really similar. That's very interesting. It's a very interesting point. And uh, 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 Eric, uh, it's one of the reasons I moved here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to be a couple of years ahead, you know, so that so you can <laughs> write write the better stories. And uh, <laughs> and uh, Eric, do you have do you, you know from from Germany? You know, you, you know the, the the country has moved quite fast in the last couple of years uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, the availability of streaming services, but uh, physical is still such a huge part of the industry uh, that uh, it's going to take uh, probably longer than it's going to take Britain to reach uh, to reach those levels. But do you think uh, Germany as well has got the opportunity to get to the same level as uh, Norway in this in this front? Uh, number wise, I, I can't <laughs> I can't make this point, but oh, of course, it doesn't yeah. feel like it doesn't feel like actually. Um, but um, yeah, we we are definitely um, think or looking um, into these um, Scandinavian markets. Also for for the uh, Berlin Music Week, we are, which we're doing the program for at the moment, we also um, had the idea to to come up with one of these um, Scandinavian markets. But this um, um, case uh, with Sweden to to have some deep insights and invite some people from there because I think. Um, the, these uh, models, um, the Scandinavian model um, in, of music industry is really, everybody's really curious about over here. So yeah. it's really necessary to, to um, jump a bit deeper um, uh, into this topic. Well, yeah, I think I, I don't have anything to add. That's great. Uh, and uh, so going back to the UK, uh, just uh, Darren Martin, just uh, quickly close on this story. But uh, what do you guys think uh, of? Uh, of the possibility, like Duncan said, of, of Britain just being a couple of years down the line and uh, uh, finding ourselves in uh, this much coveted position of uh, seeing uh, uh, double digit growth in the music industry. Do you think it's going to happen, uh, Martin? Uh, I honestly couldn't say if, if, uh, if it's going to happen, but you know, I mean, I think, you know, given that Duncan essentially lives three years in the future, um, <laughs> you know, he, he can probably help us out uh, with that. Yeah. Just, you know, Google it for us. Um, <laughs> What I'd say, though, is, you know, if, if it is going to happen, then fantastic. Well, you know, essentially, we should be holding up that article and going, look, guys, in three years, everything's going to be okay. Let's all go to the pub. <laughs> Darren, we we'll go to the pub anyway, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe, maybe that's why it's going so well here, because the alcohol's so expensive that no one can afford to go to the pub. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, Darren, carry on. That's three years in the future. That's a horrible dystopia for a drinker like me, Duncan. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I was going to say, actually, I read a, a brilliant quote today from Gabe Newell of um, Valve, you know, games company, where he said, we almost certainly see piracy as like a service problem, not a pricing problem. And, I, and that really struck a chord with me because I think it's very, very true, you know, that it, as, as someone like, I mean, on a slight tangent, although it does relate to the Norway story, you know, it's a continual annoyance to me when I try and use a service like, I don't know, Sky On Demand, and it's kind of crapping out and doesn't stream properly and things like that. And then you wind up going to the Pirate Bay, getting the thing that you're actually paying for to get on demand from Sky, and you pull it over into a digital locker service and stream it perfectly well from there. You know, yeah. that... Yeah highlights the problem. I mean, Fred Wilson did a post on this to a similar effect, you know, about a year ago, where exactly the same point. It was like, why do I pay for services that are kind of crappy when you realize that there's other routes you can take that make life so much easier? You know, that's not right. And, you know, like Fred, I'm, I'm not sat here too broke to pay for services. I will gladly pay for services that, you know, deliver upon what I'm after. And, and I... Yeah, that really resonated with me, that whole comment from Gabe, because, yeah, I just think if the service is good and is meeting you on those levels, then people will pay for it. And I think, unfortunately, in music, but generally in media, you know, there's a whole thing with rights holders and all of this kind of ridiculously comp uh, 
complicated um, system, you know, through which we manage rights and payments and everything, that uh, it just makes life a lot harder than it should be with this kind of thing. So yeah. I think the biggest thing that could speed all of this up is streamlining these things a lot more so people can just get access in a more meaningful manner. And, uh, and that, to me, would make a huge difference. And I think, you know, within the, the Norwegian story, it's, you know, it, it was, I think, whilst music was a part of the story, I think on a broader level, it was that streaming media, you know, i.e. television and such, was also very healthy, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I remain confident, but that's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, going back again to, the, to the, the, the Spotify story, you know, there was a similar thing, point that Bob left sets made. It was like, you know, have we reached a point now where artists are like criticizing models that still haven't fully developed yet? Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think it's a similar thing there where it's kind of, we have to follow this along and make it work, you know, and, and that's where you start beating piracy when there has to be a little bit of give and take and a bit of a, of a you know, a, a view that you adapt and evolve to a, a very changing market. For sure, and uh, uh, you know, continuing on the on the streaming front, but moving on to the U.S., there was a very interesting story that actually follows up from what we just, uh, talked about last week, and it's actually quite intriguing because uh, literally like three days after we read about the rumors of Daisy and AT and T being perhaps in talks, and Daisy looking for a, a carrier partner to launch in a big way in the U.S. when it launches later this year, uh, we discover three days later that AT and T has bought a Leap Wireless, uh, and uh, why does that matter? So Leap Wireless owns Cricket, uh, which is a mobile network and in turn uh, that uh, is uh, that owns uh, the music uh, service uh, music streaming service move music uh, which is associated with cricket, exclu uh, cricket exclusively at the moment and uh, it's uh, one of the largest subscription based services in the in the US and uh, we don't have any recent numbers i think the la latest ones are for from february packed the service as 1.6 million subscribers which was similar to Spotify at the time and so uh, this is a, a huge move because it means that either AT&T is planning on uh, using movie, Move instead of uh, uh, Daisy uh, to provide uh, uh, music subscriptions to all of its customers, or it's gonna operate on a two-tier basis where AT&T is gonna use Daisy as a premium option with the association of the Beats brand that is still valuable, and uh, it's gonna continue operating the Cricket Network with its Move Music as a second tier, less expensive options option for people that have less disposable income. Uh, so uh, what do you guys think? Do, do you think that there is space for a two-tier approach for such a huge network as AT&T, or have the chances of Daisy actually partnering with the the carrier diminished since the announcement? Uh, Martin, I think there's scope for two tiers. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a huge carrier with a huge amount of users spread across a, a ridiculous amount of phones um, in areas where you know certain aspects of streaming work brilliantly and areas of the US where streaming won't work at all because the reception just isn't there. Um, and I think in that sense, you know, the idea of it being um, you know, a two-tier model and one being premium and one possibly being, you know, either cheaper or free or just plan inclusive is, is highly likely. Um, I would expect that, you know, Daisy and the association with Beats and the amount of credibility that that brings is going to be something that they would see as being able to drive a higher rate premium option, which would probably be targeted at the higher rate premium package uh, cell phone plans and also yeah. the actual devices themselves. Um, as incentive to actually go ahead and you know spend the you know sixty yeah. seventy dollars a month on a on a plan as opposed to fifteen to twenty. Yeah, and uh, uh, Duncan, on, on your front, do you think that from a technology perspective, because uh, you, you covered so, so much tech as well with, with Wired, do you think that uh, you know AT and T has the guts to go with a two-pronged approach uh, on music streaming, given how reluctant uh, uh, carriers in the U.S. have been to uh, approach music streaming so far? I mean. Uh Again, this, this sort of comes down to consumer choice a bit. You can't really foist something on someone that they don't want. We've seen yeah. massive failures from services like Comes With Music from Nokia when people have tried to do exactly this, you know, foist something on, bundle it in, but it still doesn't necessarily take off in any measurable way. If the service is good, then people will want to use it. If it's not, then they won't. That's really the bottom line for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Darren, do you, feel like, do you feel the same way? Do you feel like there is uh, an opportunity there for... Uh, having two different approaches for different types of customers, or is that just too complicated for the market? I mean, to be honest, my overarching view when it comes to the American music market, but something I was actually going to say earlier, was that, you know, we talk a lot about 
know, in the last conversations we were talking about artists and what artists are doing. As Duncan rightly said, it's sort of when the artists are leading that conversation, you know, they're not the customer. But if the success of Pandora and things like that, stay sides kind of demonstrated anything. I think, as I've said on, on this show before, it's kind of that I think the man in the street doesn't really care as much as we all like to think he does about music and having access to music. I mean, there's a sort of weird default position where a bunch of us that work in and around music obviously love music. But if I went out in the street right now and just grabbed the first guy walking past, dragged him in here to partake in the discussion, he'd probably be shrugging a lot and saying, I don't really care. Yeah. If the price is good, then that's nice. But, I, you know, and all this sort of thing. So I think sometimes you get these complex offerings and people are just sitting there going, I, I, don't, I don't really care. I'm not so fast. You know, it's not that important. Yeah. Uh, so I suspect it may well struggle. You know, it's... I mean, it's a tough sell, and you know, as Duncan said, we've been there before with other stuff getting bundled in, and I think this is the problem: is if you're a sort of, you know, passing music fan, you wouldn't go running towards that. You'd probably be sitting there working out if you're paying more because you're getting it, and yeah. if so, whether you can yeah. lose it and pay less. You know, and we're seeing this in the UK where you've got the O2 app that gives you the top 40, which doesn't seem to have set the world on fire. You know, there's a bunch of examples, and it's. I just think it is this sort of horrid irony that in the context of these conversations, we discuss them as people that love music, but when you talk to just the average person, they're not asked. They yeah. like music, yeah. they're into it, but they listen to the radio, and you know what I mean? So two-tier offerings, it's probably just going to you know, bewilder a lot of people. And well, two different services as well, which is even more, more confusing. Uh, but yeah. uh, Eric, in Germany, uh, you know, Deutsche Telekom has done very well with its partnership with Spotify. Uh, I was wondering, do, do you feel like there, w there could be a space for a, a second-tier service that was, for example, half the price or less, uh, that maybe offered less, less, less options, but still allowed uh, consumers to get some uh, amount of music on their mobile? And would there be interest in that? You mean like specifically um, with regards to Deutsche Telekom? Or in well, you know, in Germany in general, like for example, you know, here in the UK there is this uh, service where you can pay a pound a week and you get the entire t top 40 uh, downloaded mm -hmm. on your phone every week and you can sort of swap it around every week. Uh, uh, and, you know, Cricket in the US I think charges uh, $5.00. Uh, but it's got like a more limited set of features than uh, Spotify, for example. So, uh, do you feel like there could be like a, a market for a, a lower price, the service that offers less features as well? Mm, yeah. Well, basically, I'd say there there would be uh, the space. Um, but um, another point was like, uh, for instance, uh, when we're talking about brands, I think um, Deutsche Telekom is a valuable brand over here, obviously, and, and so is Spotify, so this, this was a very good match, so you, you had this brand awareness, and yeah. you had like these billboard um, um, campaigns, like um, ads for, for this bundle of Deutsche Telekom and, and Spotify, I mean, there's, there's a lot of effort behind this, this um, campaign, so I guess that's the reason why it was so successful. So it would be, or will be harder for, for another player to, to um, just um, get this level of awareness. I think that, that, that's, that's the bigger problem uh, in this context. But I'd say yes, it would work if you, if you put some marketing money into it. Yeah, sure. And guys, let's, let's just take a minute to talk about uh, Berlin Music Week. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you sort of how, how is the organization for that going and um, what are you aiming for and when is it all happening so the listeners can have a clue and, uh, and perhaps uh, go and check out the website and join in for, for um, September. It's happening uh, between the 4th and the 8th of September. Great. The conference that we are part of with, with all together now and we're thinking we are part of uh, curating the Berlin Music Week conference part and that is on the 5th and the 6th. And we have, uh, uh, in particular, a focus on, on music and technology this year. So that might be of interest to the listeners to this uh, show. Absolutely. Uh, right. And the, the day, the specific music and technology day will take place on the Friday, the 6th of September. So this is when you should come over. Maybe This is also the day when uh, IFA starts yeah. here in Berlin. So maybe two good reasons to um, visit Berlin um, this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely, that's great. And so, uh, what, what's the website for that, just in case people wanted to check out more? It's berlin-music-week.de. That's great. Awesome. Well, mm -hmm. I'll go and check it out. And I think I'm going to have to condense the show because this is, uh, we've just talked for a long time about the first story. And so, I guess I'm going to have to go, I'm, I'm tr just trying to choose the most appropriate story to end with. I'm going to go with Jay-Z, I think, just because it's like a 
it's a parable like you know it's we've been talking about it for weeks i think darren you were here a few weeks ago when we started talking about it when the news broke and uh this week i hope that we end the coverage of the jay-z uh, magna carta holy grail holy grail industry side of things uh, uh, with the results of the first week sales and so the results are in and they beat all expectations uh, catapulting magna carta holy grail to the second highest week one seller in the u.s uh, behind only justin timberlake uh, so the album sold uh, 527,000 copies in the first week uh, of course it's uh, it's more than half it's just more than half of what uh, Timberlake scored but it's a lot more than what uh, for example uh, uh, Daft Punk uh, did uh, who were currently in the second place with 339,000 uh, copies sold in the first week uh, so on top of that uh, Forbes reports that the album has beaten Spotify uh, records with 14 million streams in the first week and uh, according to estimates this could have earned uh, Jay-Z a further 600k plus or minus uh, uh, taking into account that most of these plays would have been from the from the free tier users so uh, this dissipates, I guess, some of the questions that we all had around uh, cannibalizations deriving from the Samsung partnership and then the uh, giveaway of, of all those copies of the album uh, on the model itself uh, and also on the privacy and delivery issues that the Samsung app itself experienced. It doesn't seem like any of those things have actually overall hampered uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, huge impact of the album across uh, all mediums. So, the numbers speak for themselves at this point, and I think that's why I, I hope that we can draw this story to a close after seeing how uh, well it's done. Uh, so do you think this uh, proves that the model is worth pursuing and we're going to see more of these uh, partnerships uh, crop up in the coming uh, uh, weeks and months? Martin, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's difficult, right? Because what you're looking at here is, you know, one of the world's biggest artists releasing, yeah. a, re releasing a good album after not having had one out for a while. It was always going to do always. well. Right? There, was, there was no way around that. I think it's, it's difficult to say whether, you know, the medium by which it was originally released and the Samsung, you know, hold over that and the free copies available, you know, that wasn't necessarily going to hamper it because at the end of the day, this is a huge artist putting out a huge release with an immense amount of publicity and hype around it. Yeah. Um, I don't think that it's also a... It's, it's not a good case study in that sense because it's very little to draw away from it. If you were to yeah. do this with, you know, a, an artist, like, you know, could you do this with an unknown artist? Absolutely not. Oh, no, of course right. not, no, no. Could you do it with, like, a middling tier artist or, you know, someone that's never really sold records outside of the UK, maybe never got a record past the top 20 before? Possibly. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to go with multimedium over a couple of weeks worth of promotion, you know, it's going to shift units somewhere. Um, yeah. You know, giving it away for free in a time with a mobile application, it's going to work for some, it won't work for others. There are only certain artists that are going to be able to put that amount of weight behind doing this in the first place. When I was at Universal, we tried to do this quite often, and frankly, the numbers just never stacked up for the majority of people that we looked at it for. You know, if you've got a partner like Samsung, which in no doubt they were absolutely happy to throw a ton of money at this in the first place, then sure, that's going to work. But <laughs> You know, outside of that, no, I don't think so. But in that sense, I think when you're an artist of this scale, you certainly aren't going to be hampered by giving it away for free, you know, on some phones. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, that's what I said last week. I mean, last week I said that if, if this was going to go well for Jay-Z, it may result in seeing perhaps three, four, five tops campaigns of this type a year for really major artists if they can get the deals in place and... and 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 they have a huge release coming out that might work but it, i think it, we'd struggle to see it happening for for more uh darren uh, same thing for you I, I would imagine that uh even if you work with a pretty pretty big artist as well it, this wouldn't really work for them it, it, it'd have to be a very specific type of artist like rihanna or beyonce or jay-z or maybe Lil wayne or something yeah, I mean, as Martin said, there's a few factors that sort of add to it in the same manner as Darth Punk, David Bowie and Justin Timberlake, where they've all been away for a good while and then they, you know, come back and, you know, so, I mean, there's a couple of interesting things I thought around the Jay-Z campaign, particularly notable was that there was no lead single, it was yeah. just put out there, which I thought was uh, something people slightly missed. But I think actually the, the whole app download thing is sort of mistaking the bigger picture, which was that... Now, by doing this gigantic deal with Samsung, it guaranteed like millions being spent on advertising 
that left the label, you know, that was entirely free of the label's own budget. Yeah. And Samsung were bankrolling all of those ads in the States that ran on primetime TV to hundreds of millions of people. And they were paying for all of that. So the whole thing is when you do these deals, it just augments his budget to kind of biblical proportions. Yeah. So that yeah. at that point, you better hope you get some serious sales off the back of it because the money spent on it, whilst not the label's money entirely, is <laughs> still a massive amount of money. You know, if you were to do that on any other level where the label alone was spending it, there'd probably be a sort of profit and loss bloodbath, you know, because, you, you, you know, you've got to account for this stuff. So... It's an interesting model, but yeah, as Martin said, I don't think you can take a massive amount from it. I mean, it's it's just an exceptional thing for a fairly exceptional artist, and so I'm, I'm not I'm not really going to sit here, uh, you know, pouring over it too greatly. I'm yeah, I'll, I'll be more interested to see what the Lady Gaga app does because I've got a gut feeling that that will die a slow, painful death. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> so, yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> interesting and uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, end by asking a couple of different questions actually to uh, Eric uh, and Andrea uh, there was a story about pan-European license, pan European licensing this week so I just wanted to hit you up on that one uh, just talking about how uh, the EU is uh, slowly stepping uh, towards uh, uh, a pan-European model uh, you know there's been uh, for the first time a motion that has been approved uh, uh, by the European Parliament Col Committee for Legal Affairs uh, unanimously uh, to uh, create uh, a framework for allowing uh, pan-European licensing across the 28 member states in Europe. Of course, this still has to go through a whole process in the Parliament to get approved, and who knows whether it's going to be approved, but it seems like a step forward. Uh, do you feel like uh, this is something that uh, is necessary, and especially in Germany, you, you, you have had issues uh, in terms of uh, societies uh, not licensing music, and uh, especially yeah. GEMA. So do you feel like this is something that will, will be supported in Germany? Well, um, in general, I think it depends on how that uh, will be organized. If yeah. it will be organized transparently and uh, according to several um, um, things that have been pointed out here that are not working with the current uh, um, collecting society and, and processes over here. So, um, so, so, it, so it really depends, I would say, on how those things are being mapped out. Yeah. But um, we'll actually also have a discussion about that at Berlin Music Week. <laughs> Great. <laughs> ah, surprise. One more reason to go. <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, we'll have several people from like the, those new uh, societies over Europe that are being set up uh, in, in response to what's currently on like in Portugal or in Germany. And we have the um, Unison uh, group over here who are working at the Euro European level. So we, we have several... Uh, things going on. Yeah, yeah. We talked to uh, uh, C3S uh, before the show, and, and they told us we must mention that they just started uh, their crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. That's so right. if you want to if you want to support um, alternative collecting society models, C3S um, mm -hmm. is like an option. And yeah. Yeah, and if you're going to be a Raper Band Festival, they're also going to have uh, uh, some sort of stand there. So you can yeah. go and check them out and see what they're up to, which is really interesting. We talked uh, we talked about them on the show a few times. And Duncan, I wanted to finish with you and talking about uh, Logic... Uh, X or Logic 10, I'm not sure uh, how, to, how to pronounce it, but uh, I'm very excited about it, although uh, I'm, I'm not th that excited to spend £129 on it uh, quite uh, right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, if anything, uh, I want to mention it because it's, uh, you know, the first release uh, in four years uh, of uh, really a, a, piece of a piece of software that used, is used by millions or uh, millions? Hundreds of thousands, I'm not sure. Uh, worldwide, lots. Al along, uh, lots of people worldwide, <laughs> alongside Pro Tools and Cubase uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Rebirth and, uh, and a couple of others. Uh, and, and so uh, I guess the reviews were all pretty positive. It looks like they brought in uh, a new look, which makes it look uh, prettier, I guess, and probably more resource intensive for that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to run great on the new Mac Pro uh, for three grand. And uh, But surprisingly, they haven't really cut any of the Pro features, apparently, from, from other reviews say. Uh, so they haven't really alienated uh, users in the same way that they did when they released the Final Cut Pro uh, 10, which instead seemed to be a step back for a lot of the professional community on, on the functionality front. So, uh, of course, the sticking point is that it confirms uh, what we all feared, that because Apple lowered the pr uh, prices on uh, pro-grade apps on the uh, on the Mac App Store, 
that also means that there's no upgrade path and so you have to purchase the app again once uh, a new uh, overhaul version comes out so if you bought uh, logic 9 three months ago uh, I, i'm really sorry for you because uh, uh, <laughs> you're not you're not going to see your money back and uh, so you know i just wanted to ask you a comment you know what do you think about logic pro x uh, are you excited about it well, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, never be, I've never used Logic, I'll be quite All honest right, cool. with you. I've never actually used it. So um, I can't sort of offer any enormous insight on there. But what, what I will say is that Apple is doing, by, by cutting the prices of all these sort of supposedly pro apps, like really, really harshly, what they're doing is they're creating this um, sort of tier of content creators among the, the, uh, the are people that would never used to kind of be considered as content creators. And that's what's driving so much of the stuff that we've talked about in this whole show. All the stuff in Spotify, all the stuff and everything. All these new artists are people who have managed to be able to afford a copy of Logic because the prices are being slashed. And that this is what's driving incredible changes in all of the creative industries, not just music, in um, filmmaking and in photography and all kinds of stuff. Apple is doing a really, really interesting job in, in bringing creativity on, on a professional scale to people who weren't able to do that once upon a time. Yeah. And that is going to be an enormous change in the music industry that we've only just started seeing the tip of. That is going to be the real difference that the internet brings to music. Very, very interesting. Uh, any Logic user that is excited about this out there? Or n nobody? <laughs> nobody? Only me. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to have to spend the £129 at some point and, and see what it's all about. Let and us know if, if it's any good. And see if my computer copes with it. I mean, it's struggling as it is, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> it's great. Well, thanks so much, guys, for joining me on the show. Uh, I'm going to do uh, a quick round. So, uh, uh, Duncan, anything to uh, plug your end? Website wise? Um, no, not especially. Um, Gothenburg is wonderful. You should all come and live here. It's five years ahead of the entire rest of the world. <laughs> Excellent. Are you, are you planning to stay there after you, after you finish your masters? Or? I've, got a, I've got another year to study here, and then all after right. that, we'll see. I like it very much. So, Great. Yeah, awesome. I don't know uh, yet. Martin, anything you're in? Uh, yeah, I just want to do a quick plug for uh, the Music Hack Day newsletter, which has now been launched. I can't quite uh, figure out why it's taken us five years to actually do a central <laughs> version of this. Uh, uh, but, I'm surprised. Uh, you know, uh, it's out there now. So if you go to newsletter.musichackday.org, you can sign up there, and it'll be the uh, the main announcement point outside of things like Twitter for uh, new events uh, that we have coming That's up. That's a really uh, good idea, actually, because I kept missing things happening because I just didn't know they were. Well, happening, so. we did a bunch of feedback uh, recently from anyone that's ever been to any of the events, and even if they haven't been to the events. And one of the biggest things was it's like, well, we never really know when they get announced, and it's like, well, well, I know when they get announced. It's like, well, <laughs> that's because I write the tweet. Great. Uh, so. Uh, now we have uh, something a little bit more persistent uh, for people to uh, figure out uh, when stuff's happening and how they can uh, get involved with that. Um, so uh, hopefully that's going to mean that people feel a bit better informed than they have done in previous years. Perfect. And uh, Darren, of course, it's uh, motiveunknown.com and you can subscribe to his uh, Daily Digest new newsletter there. Anything else you're on? Oh God, too many things to, to list here. Um... Yeah, just I've got so much stuff happening. It's ridiculous. New, <laughs> new, new Moby video going up today. Some Moby's album campaigns back on the go. It's a really good record. Well worth checking. Drenge album coming in August. They're kicking ass and taking names. Even Tom Watts loves them. Uh, local natives on tour at the moment. I've got Eliza and the Bear coming on Radio One with their new single Friends. Uh, we've got the AIM Awards coming in September. I'm doing all the stuff more there. <laughs> so I can't remember all the other things. And aside from that, my only other point is that it's now. I'm just going to try and hold this Eight thing up. Past oh, third oh <laughs> nice. That's the temperature in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I don't. I'm glad I don't have a thermometer in here because uh, it's curtains all around, and I'm just like. If it wasn't for this, I would have expired by now. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much because uh, it's been a long show as well. That's great, and uh, of course, uh, Eric and Andrea. It's uh, uh, Berlin-Music-Week.day, like uh, you said. And uh, anything else uh, at your end? Uh, well, are you good? It's worth the trip. I mean, it's the double pack, IFA, Berlin Music Week. There's the Berlin Festival at the same weekend. So I think it's a good package to, or Absolutely. A good place to come, actually. And it's just uh, actually people that are planning to go, just stay in Berlin a couple of weeks. I think uh, a couple of weeks later, there's the Rethink Music uh, 
a startup mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and so just, just, just take a couple of weeks off or go and work in Berlin for a couple of weeks. I'm sure lots of people can work remotely these days. So uh, I'm sure it's a fun place to be for, for a little while. Uh, great. Well, thanks so much for joining me and thanks for listening to the show. Uh, Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of channels, as I mentioned at the beginning. You can go for, uh, ahead and uh, subscribe to the newsletter or subscribe to Digital Music Trends. Uh, uh, dot com on uh, uh, iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, uh, and the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash digital music trends. Uh, uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.